Okay, so in part one of the Drake equation, uh, we looked at the first four factors of Drake's estimate of how many intelligent civilizations are out there right now that we can communicate with. And so far, the four terms that we looked at have something in common. We have some pretty good data on them. I mean, we know how many stars roughly are in the galaxy and how many of those are sun-like. Uh, we're starting to get a very good estimate now of how many planets are out there. And even recently, how many of those planets are Earth-like in the sense that they could have liquid water. And here's the good news. So far, all of this is very positive in the sense that there are going to be plenty of places, billions of Earth-like planets and large moons in our galaxy um, that could evolve intelligent life. Well, now we come to the last three terms of Drake's famous equation, and these terms are quite a bit different in every way. And, and the first way is that we really don't have a clue as to uh, the actual values here. There's a lot of guesswork and speculation, starting with this one, the fraction of Earth-like places that actually develop life. So just because you have all the right conditions, uh, does that mean that you necessarily then develop life? Um, this is really the ball game to me. If, um, if this value turns out to be low, if, if life is very um, rare, uh, then we're just not going to find it out there. Or if it turns out that any time you have the right conditions, you're going to evolve life, well, that's going to be quite helpful in our search for life. And uh, the problem is we just, we only have one example of life and that's life on earth. This is why finding life in those places I mentioned in the last lecture, Mars and Europa and Enceladus, if we could find just one other example of life, it would help us so much with this term. Uh, because for example, if we find that life has independently developed somewhere else in our solar system, a whole different kind of life, um, then we will know that life is out there all over the place because if on our one little grain of sand, life developed in two different places, it means that life is going to be very, very plentiful. Or we might make the discovery that we are Martians. We might find that our solar system was seeded, okay, from without the idea of uh, panspermia, that life was floating around out there. Um, it, it could turn out that we have Martian cousins, or on Europa, that we find life there and it has um, the same RNA or something like that that indicates that it's uh, uh, that it formed uh, the way that life on Earth formed. Um, but right now it's all speculation because we have only the one example of life. So this is a big problem. This is a huge question mark. Now, can we get anything out of this? Well, the one thing I think that we can be very, very positive about um, in terms of our guessing on whether life is, um, is rare or not, is the fact that life seemed to develop very early on in Earth's history. That's something we can hang on to as a positive um, because basically as soon as the Earth cooled down enough to have life, it had life. Whether the life came from somewhere else or it developed around the hydrothermal vents or wherever, it, wherever life came from, it started about as quickly as it could start. And that's a good sign. That's something we can be uh, optimistic about. Now, then there's the whole question of what exactly do we mean by life? You know, is a virus living? Um, well, we normally say no, but you know, it has some of the attributes of life uh, reacting to its environment, things like that. So basically, usually life is defined as something that grows and reproduces. That's really maybe the biggest one. Uh, at, at some point, did organic carbon-based compounds just learn to split and, and, and create a copy of itself? It was at the beginning of life. That's kind of how we look at it. And of course, over generations, we have evolution naturally takes place. And, and the winning traits, the traits that um, allow for more reproduction, those traits continue on. And, and the ones that um, are more negative towards reproduction, they're not going to continue. Um, that gets into a lot of, of course, biology and, and biochemistry and stuff. And uh, anyway, that, it's just something to think about. What, what exactly do we mean by life? And um, again, I think that the, the idea that, that life 
reproduces is really maybe the biggest thing. Now, here's another factor. Uh, let's go back to the first time that uh, scientists tried to see how life could have developed uh, naturally. The Yuri Miller experiment back in the 1950s, they just um, took some of the elements that they thought existed on early Earth and some of those conditions, and they applied some electricity, which would kind of simulate lightning, and they applied a lot of UV radiation because, of course, the atmosphere was very different then. We didn't have the ozone layer and so forth. And they found something very interesting. The, it, that little glob of organic material did develop some complexity, and it developed some of the basic building blocks of life, okay, some amino acids and so forth. Uh, that's very, very interesting that naturally those things can develop. Now, that experiment was very flawed uh, because they didn't understand the conditions of early earth the way that we do now but of course this kind of experiment continues to this day and different colleges try this with different conditions and find that they can develop um, an, inter an interesting array of different more complex organic compounds now having a complex organic compound is still different of course than having life itself that would be absolutely huge if somehow we ever developed in a laboratory an organic compound that learns to replicate itself. That would, uh, that would be huge. Anyway, the other thought is that I mentioned earlier is that life could have come from elsewhere, panspermia. We know we have seen different uh, complex organic compounds in molecular clouds, in comets, most famously in meteorites. That's how we kind of envision if life, let's say, developed first on Mars, it could hitch a ride on a meteorite, and have landed on the earth or vice versa. And we have seen that some species can survive in the harshness of space. We've tried this on the International Space Station. And uh, there are uh, microscopic critters that can survive the vacuum of space long enough to travel uh, between the planets. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, for example, the Murchison meteorite had 22 different amino acids that had developed just naturally. Again, that's not life. It's just the building blocks of life. But it's an interesting hint on how life might have formed and how it might have come here. So many questions to be answered. Now, how about this? I always talk about organic compounds, carbon-based compounds, and a lot of my students will say, well, isn't that being short-sighted? Well, yes, it probably is. I mean, carbon is special. It is. Carbon is just very reactive and it's, it, it can form these long chains and these complex things. But, you know, if you look at the area where it's at in the periodic table, you notice uh, uh, silicon there in the same group uh, might accomplish the same thing. Sometimes in Star Trek, they'll meet life that is silicon based rather than carbon based. And there's nothing wrong with that. Also, we, we always talk about water. But the number one thing about water is that it's liquid. It just allows material to travel around inside a cell. And you could certainly have life develop with a different liquid as that transporting medium. Um, like ammonia, if you had a really cold world that's way too cold for water, maybe you could have liquid ammonia and that could be used uh, for life. Uh, again, we don't know. And, and if you think we're short-sighted, yes, we probably are. But we kind of have to look. Our resources are limited. So when we pick places to look, we know that carbon and water work. And so if we're going to spend money on spacecraft to go places, we're going to look for the places that have carbon and have water. Okay? Not that scientists don't realize that life may exist in other forms. It's just that, you know, again, we have limited resources. Okay. Next up. I love this one. This was an interesting one to talk about. Let's say that life does develop very easily. And that may be the case. What fraction of those places that develop life will develop intelligent life? Well, again, we only have the one example, but we have a lot of interesting clues about this, uh, both negative and positive. On the positive side, of course, uh, with uh, natural selection, with evolution, you would think that intelligence would rise up naturally. It's an, it's an advantage to, to be intelligent and to outwit uh, your predators uh, or your prey. So that seems to be a very, very big positive. Now, for a negative, we do have to look at the history of life on Earth. And we know that for billions and billions of years, life was incredibly simple. 
nowhere close to having intelligence. And that's a big, big negative on this. Okay? And even though we might have billions of places that have life, it may be incredibly rare to have the time and for it to develop intelligence. And so sadly, we could be the most intelligent life in the galaxy right now, which is kind of scary. So again, if we look back at the history of life on Earth, um, it took an incredibly long time uh, to develop. I mean, even just, you had a billion years go by probably before you had anything um, of any complexity whatsoever. Um, and, you know, where algae eventually was the, the champion of evolution at that point, and, um, which is kind of sad. And after another billion years, you have amoeba, and a billion years after that, um, the most complex life on Earth was a sponge, which doesn't even have a brain. Uh, so billions of years go by before there's any complexity. And then interestingly enough, of course, about why and what perhaps geological changes occurred on the Earth to allow this to happen. But there was a biological big bang, the Cambrian explosion, where suddenly evolution just took off. And we see this in the genetic record and the fossil record. And um, at that point, that's really when intelligence took hold. Um, and, and of course, not just in, in the mammals. We'll, we'll talk about you know other species and squid and things like that that uh, have intelligence. But um, anyway... Why did it take so long? Again, maybe the conditions had to be right. Is this always the case? We don't know. Now, if you want an example of, of animal intelligence, and again, that's what we're talking about, that not just humans have intelligence, um, we'll look at a quick little video here that uh, illustrates this uh, from dolphins. And this takes place, uh, I'm a teacher in South Florida, and it's, this actually, this little film takes place in the Florida Keys. And they're showing dolphins here. Let me skip ahead um, to the part that I want to show you where the dolphins actually work together. It's pretty amazing. And one dolphin uh, will swim in a circle. And the fish that are within that circle get sort of freaked out. They don't know what to do. And they start trying to jump out of this circle. It's in very shallow water down in the Keys. And... Um, so the, the fish start freaking out. They're being surrounded by sort of a wall of, of dirt that this dolphin is kicking up. And uh, they start jumping out of the circle. Well, in the meantime, his dolphin buddies are uh, waiting outside of the circle for a nice uh, lunch because these fish jump right out of the water. And there, there you see the dolphin making the circle. And now the fish... They're going to freak out. They're going to jump out of the circle. And the dolphins just sit there and, uh, and catch them in midair. And uh, so this is a, an incredible amount of teamwork uh, that has to take place and communication between the dolphins to get this to happen. It's a very interesting case. You see the fish flying up in the air right there. Okay, another example. Well, there are plenty of examples. We've done studies over and over again. You know, take an octopus and give it a little... Um, yeah, something that has to get out of a jar and it will figure out how to unscrew the jar lid. Lots and lots of examples of animals exhibiting intelligence. But that brings us to our next uh, part of the Drake equation. When you have intelligence, what fraction of intelligent creatures would develop technology? Because, listen, dolphins are intelligent, but, um, you know, they're not building radio dishes, that's what we're talking about. We have to have an alien species that's advanced enough that can actually communicate with us, whether it's through radio or laser pulses or something. Um, that's a different question. Now, this is one I think that we can be uh, very optimistic on. It, it just seems like intelligence is going to lead to technology uh, here on Earth. Every civilization that was developing independently all around the world, they all developed uh, tools and things like that in isolation from each other. So once you have the cranial capacity um, that's necessary, it appears that you would start building technology. And again, just like with intelligence, we're, we're not the only species on Earth that can use um, technology. Um, here we have at the bottom of the screen an ape, uh, gorilla, that's uh, crossing a river. 
And she's actually using a stick to prod and poke and see how deep the water is so she doesn't fall in and drown. It's an incredible uh, use of technology and of intelligence. So again, I think this one uh, we can be pretty darn positive about that it's probably inevitable. Um, in this little video here, this is really nice. They're going to show um, some chimpanzees and you have a mama chimp and a couple babies. And let me see if I can, my video is running really slowly here. Um, but anyway, what they're going to do in the video, again, let me see if I can perhaps fast forward a bit. The mama chimp, they want to get to some, um, termites and, uh, they're located in their mound. And so the, uh, the mama chimp takes, uh, a stick and is able to, uh, Oh, gosh. Sorry about this. Speaking of technology, having my own technical difficulties here. Um, once again, let me see if I can skip ahead to the part of the video uh, where the mama chimp then takes a stick, pokes it into the uh, termite nest, and the termites are sort of attacking the stick, uh, thinking it's like an intruder. There's the stick. And uh, they grab hold on of it, as you can see there. They're fighting it. And uh, the mama chimp just pulls it out and has herself a nice little termite popsicle. That's technology. That's technology. And now she's going to, you know, the, the babies are watching and learning how to do that. She's passing it on to the next generation, that use of technology. Um, I have a little clip here, a famous clip. I won't show the whole clip here, but from uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, showing the first time that our early ancestors would have used uh, technology. This one hominid here has uh, figured out how to use a bone um, as a weapon. And that's what this scene is. And these other, this other group here has taken over the local watering hole. And now this guy comes back. Now he's even taught his friends here how to use this bone as a weapon. They're coming back to take back the watering hole. And because they are, are smarter and they've developed tools, technology, of course, they're going to win the fight here for the watering hole. And um, this is, this is a, a key moment in the history of uh, humanity where we first used tools there. You see he beats up the leader of the uh, sort of enemy group there. And so his group has developed technology and it leads to this famous scene. I'll let it play out here. So that's it. The, uh, the other group retreats. Oh, he's still beating that guy senseless there. And uh, they've won out and the smarter group intelligence. Now they will be able to spawn. They have control of the resources and, um, the smarter group is going to win out. And we, we're coming up to the famous scene here, his triumphant moment. Throwing the bone in the air. And that's, yeah, again, a pretty uh, famous scene from this movie. And then we're going to skip ahead just a little bit in evolution where that technology leads to space stations in our modern, modern world. Okay, so it's a great, great scene in the movie showing these milestones of uh, human history. Okay, so just to kind of recap, we start out with the, the um, Drake equation with plenty of examples. We have lots and lots of stars to choose from. That's the first term. But we only take the fraction of those stars that are sun-like, that are going to have um, the lifetime necessary to develop uh, intelligent life. And then we only take those that have planets. And then we only take the planets that are Earth-like, that can have water, and uh, so forth and so on. And then we only take the planets that um, actually that have the right conditions that actually develop life, only that life which develops intelligence, and only that intelligent life that develops technology. That's what we're talking about. Are there aliens out there that we can communicate? But there's one last term, and it's the term that not many people really ever think about or contemplate and it's, it may be the key to this whole thing, the lifetime 
of a technologically advanced civilization. Once you develop the technology necessary to communicate throughout the galaxy, what happens to your civilization? Does it come together and solve problems or does it destroy itself? And uh, based on what we've seen so far of our own uh, world, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very much in debate. You know, we just don't know what's going to happen in this century. Uh, we could very easily ruin our world um, with pollution, change our climate. Uh, we can ruin the oceans, which we're already doing. Um, of course, we've developed nuclear power, and we've seen uh, the horrific con consequences of that, as well as the, the potential for energy and things like that. Um, it's, it's a great question. And if you think about it, we had only developed radio in the late 1800s, the ability to send signals. And then within a very short amount of time, we've already started, uh, you know, the nuclear age. And by the 1960s, we almost end it all. You know, if the Cuban Missile Crisis goes a different way, uh, that's it. We start firing our nukes and the Soviet Union start firing their nukes. And today, of course, we have to worry about the pr proliferation of nuclear weapons getting in the hands of terrorists and things like that. And uh, who knows what's going to happen. So um, that's a big question, though. Once you develop the technology, what happens? That's a huge question facing us. Hey, if civilizations tend to just naturally blow themselves up, we're not going to be communicating with them. That's it, and that'd be a scary thing. Um, hopefully that's not the case, and they find ways to uh, preserve and protect their planet. But uh, anyway, we'll talk more about that in the next lecture when we talk about our efforts to actually find these signals. If aliens are out there, what are we doing uh, to try to find them? That'll be the next lecture. Thanks so much for listening.